This episode of The History Guy brought to you by World of Warships. On December 7, 1941, USS West Virginia was at Pearl Harbor on Battleship Row, moored next to USS Tennessee. During the Japanese attack, she was struck by seven torpedoes, two aerial bombs, sank in shallow water. But the Wee V would rise again to lead the U.S. battle line at the last battleship on battleship battle in world history. USS West Virginia deserves to be remembered. USS West Virginia and her sister ship USS Colorado are two of the ships that you can play in the free-to-play game World of Warships, available now on PC. One of the best parts of the game is that you get to play actual historical vessels, rendered in accurate and loving detail, a floating digital museum for people who appreciate naval history. The game includes breathtaking recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. Not just battleships, but cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and submarines. Each not just historically important and interesting, but also which offer unique challenges and advantages in fast, exciting strategic gameplay. Since launch, World of Warships has added over 500 playable ships from 10 different nations. New content is released every month. Each week there's something new to experience with a steady cadence of new missions, game updates, and events to keep you and your friends engaged for hours on end. And did I mention that the game is also available on console? As someone who plays the game a lot and really enjoys it, World of Warships is just a lot of fun to play. It's really a very good mix of strategy and action. So download the game today using the link in the description. And new players who download the game, use the code WARSHIPS, and you'll get free credits, free doubloons, free premium playtime, and even a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Between 1916 and 1923, the United States commissioned 13 battleships across five classes that were collectively referred to as the Standard Type. Designed under the concept of the battleship-centric naval strategy derived from the works of naval historian Alfred Thayer Mahan, the entire idea of the Standard Type was at odds with their counterparts in other navies. While most other navies had classes of fast and slow battleships, the United States Navy standard type concept ensured that all battleships produced had similar characteristics of speed and turn radius that allowed them to operate together as a battleship division. The ships were designed to maintain a top speed of 21 knots and a cruising range of 8,000 nautical miles. Despite the implication of standardization, the standard type ships incorporated many improvements over time. As the naval technology website Nav Weapons explains, Despite the implication of cookie-cutter production in the term, this remarkable series of ships was at once conservative and innovative. Each small class incorporated a progressive series of improvements while retaining enough commonality for the individual ships to operate successfully as a homogenous whole in the line of battle. Likewise, while the idea implies clear strategic thinking, the naval technology website Naval Gazing notes that the standardization was more the result of various political and economic pressures to hold down the ever-growing size and cost of battleships than careful planning. Still, Naval Gazing notes, they provided the U.S. with a first-rate interwar fleet. One example of the progressive improvements came with the final class of the battleships of the standard type, the Colorado class. Otherwise essentially identical to the preceding Tennessee class, instead of mounting 12 14-inch guns in four triple-gun turrets, the Colorado class would mount eight 16-inch guns in four dual turrets. The 16-inch, 45-caliber gun had some 50% more muzzle energy than the 14-inch, 50-caliber guns of the Tennessee class, and double the energy of the 12-inch, 50-caliber guns of the Wyoming class. The armored-piercing shells used by the Colorados were 838 pounds heavier than those fired by the Tennessee class, allowing them to penetrate another approximately 10 inches of side armor. While four ships of the class were laid down, the limitations of the Washington Naval Treaty required that the construction of the USS Washington, nearly 75% completed, be halted. Only three ships of the class, Colorado, Maryland, and West Virginia, were completed, And owing to the limits of naval treaties, these would be the most powerful and modern battleships produced by the United States until the two ships of the North Carolina class were commissioned on the eve of the Second World War. The last of the standard-type battleships to be built, the USS West Virginia, BB-48, was laid down on April 12, 1920. 624 feet long, with a beam of 97 feet 6 inches, she was commissioned on December 1, 1923. 
the newest and most powerful ship in the U.S. fleet. During the interwar period, West Virginia served as the flagship of the Pacific Battle Fleet. She received progressive modernization, engaged in training exercises, and participated in the 1925 fleet visit to Australia, the subject of another episode of The History Guy. Based at Pearl Harbor, she was on Battleship Row on December 7, 1941. While North Carolina and Washington had been commissioned earlier in 1941, neither was assigned to the Pacific Battle Fleet. All eight battleships on Battleship Row were standard-type battleships. West Virginia, the newest among them, was moored at berth F-6, outboard of USS Tennessee. The ship's executive officer, Roscoe Hillencotter, wrote in the ship's after-action report, I was in my cabin, just commencing to dress, when at 0755 the word was passed, Away fire and rescue party! This was followed about 30 seconds later by General Quarters. At the same time, 0755, the Marine orderly rushed into the cabin and announced, The Japanese are attacking us. Also, just at this time, two heavy shocks in the whole of West Virginia were felt. The shocks were Japanese Type 91 torpedoes, each carrying more than 700 pounds of high explosives. The United States National World War II Museum explains, As the Japanese attack began, West Virginia, her port side laid bare, became an easy target for enemy torpedoes. The first two struck simultaneously at 7.55 a.m. as General Quarter sounded. Men poured from the hatchways as she began to list. The Naval History and Heritage Command writes that West Virginia was struck by up to nine enemy torpedoes, throwing open her midships and forward hull and wrecking her rudder. The World War II Museum writes that torpedoes ripped into her hull below the waterline and bombs fell from enemy aircraft when causing sections of the superstructure to collapse. Hillencotter reported the list reaching as much as 25%. The ship was at significant risk of capsizing. Lieutenant Claude V. Ricketts was a gunnery officer, he wrote in his report. The captain then appeared, and as the ship was lifting rapidly to port, and I knew probably there were a few construction and repair officers aboard, I said, Captain, shall I go below and counter flood? He replied, Yes, do that. By then, Ricketts reported the ship was listing so heavily that on the linoleum decks it was impossible to walk without holding on to something. Ricketts' action righted the ship. The website USSWestVirginia.org notes that only prompt action by Lieutenant Claude B. Ricketts, the assistant fire control officer who had some knowledge of damage control techniques, saved the ship from the fate that befell Oklahoma, moored ahead. Meanwhile, Hill and Cotter reported the ship's batteries continued firing. Then he reported, I saw a flash of flame about 15 feet high somewhere forward on the Arizona, and just got into my feet again when there was a terrific flash of flame from the Arizona the second flash being higher than the foretop. Burning debris of size from a fraction of an inch to up to five inches in diameter rained on the quarterdeck of the West Virginia. As damage control teams desperately fought fires and the ship slowly settled in 40 feet of water, shrapnel from a bomb hit on USS Tennessee struck Captain Mervyn Binion. USS WestVirginia.org writes, Binion, hit in the abdomen, crumpled to the deck, mortally wounded, but clung tenaciously to life until just before the ship was abandoned involved in the conduct of the ship's defense up to the last moment of his life. For his conspicuous devotion to duty, extraordinary courage, and complete disregard of his own life, Captain Binion was awarded a Medal of Honor, posthumously. Among the sailors attending Binion at the time was mess attendant second-class Doris Miller. Miller was then ordered to help man a 50 caliber anti-aircraft gun, in which he had never been trained. Given basic instruction on its operation, he fired the gun until it ran out of ammunition, and was credited with down two of the attacking aircraft. For his actions, Miller became the first black man to be awarded the Navy Cross. The crew desperately fought the fires and continued firing at the attackers, but the World War II Museum writes, eventually the order to abandon ship was given, as the wounded were loaded into whaleboats and other small craft. Others either crossed over to Tennessee or dove into the oil-covered water, swimming to Ford Island. Among those jumping into the water, covered with burning oil, was 19-year-old fireman 3rd Class William F. Moore. The Munster Indiana Times wrote in 1994, In the West Virginia's Ford engine room, when the Holocaust began, he dove into the flaming sea and was burned over 80% of his body. Moore was pulled from the sea by a Marine aboard a motor launch, a moment immortalized in one of the most famous photographs of the attack. The Times continues that Moore spent nearly three years in various veterans' hospitals. His body still carries the horrible scars. But Moore never knew the name of the man who had saved him, until 1992, when at a reunion of Pearl Harbor survivors, he casually mentioned that he was in the photograph to another veteran. The man, John Latko, it turns out, had been assigned to the Marine Corps detachment of the West Virginia. He was aboard a motor launch that was taking wounded men to shore when he saw Moore in the water, and was famously photographed pulling him from the burning sea. 
These two men, captured in that dramatic moment, did not know each other's identity until a casual remark revealed their connection. Fifty-one years after it happened. Can we deny that truth is stranger than fiction, the Times wrote. The Ventura California County Star wrote in 2004, By noon on the day of infamy, the West Virginia had settled to the bottom of the harbor, a hulk of twisted flaming steel and iron. She mirrored our crippled nation, sunk, and seemingly unsalvageable. In all, 108 crew of the West Virginia, including Captain Benyon, perished in the attack. Among those is one of the most tragic tales of the battle. Three sailors, Ronald Endicott, age 18, Clifford Olds, age 20, and Louis Buddy Coston, age 21, had become trapped in an airtight storeroom in the forward hull of the sunken ship. The next day, rescuers could hear the men hammering on the walls, but there was nothing anyone could do. Shipmate Jack Miller told the Seattle Times in 2016, Cut a hole to get someone out and you'd flood the whole thing. Use a torch and risk an explosion. When the ship was finally raised, six months later, the Times writes, the clues left in the dry storeroom hinted at a horrifying demise. Flashlight batteries littered the floor. The manhole to a supply of fresh water had been opened. Emergency rations had been eaten. And the calendar, a foot high, 14 inches long, a red X scratched across the dates from December 7th to December 23rd. Sixteen days had been crossed off in the red pencil, the Times writes. The young sailors had marked their time, not knowing what had happened to their ship, or that their country was at war. Few people knew the whole truth. The Navy never told the families how long their loved ones had survived. And for those brothers and sisters who eventually found out, the truth was so devastating that they kept it a secret, even from their own parents. Arizona, Oklahoma, California, and West Virginia were sunk on Battleship Row, while Tennessee, Nevada, Maryland, and Pennsylvania were damaged. U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command notes that Tennessee was wedged tightly between the sunken West Virginia and her mooring key and had to be blasted free. Arizona and Oklahoma were beyond salvage, and so too should have been West Virginia. The National World War II Museum writes, By all accounts, she shouldn't have been there. She had suffered damage beyond any expectations her designers had. But she was an American warship, a fulfillment of Alfred T. Mahan's ideas of power projected around the world. Her salvage and repair were a feat of engineering and determination. A phoenix rises from the ashes, but USS West Virginia rose from the waters of Pearl Harbor to contribute to the defeat of the Japanese Empire. The Ventura County Star writes, In what was to be one of the greatest salvage operations in military history, the crew of the West Virginia began to work to bring the battleship back to life. The Chicago Daily Herald wrote in 1945, Patched up with what plates were available, the West Virginia was raised and steamed under her own power to a West Coast Navy yard. Battered and torn, she seemed suited only for the scrap heap. But the modern genius of our shipyards made a different story. Stripped of her main deck, the ship was rebuilt, and she emerged from her yard practically a new vessel, equipped with the most modern weapons of warfare. Roy Romano joined the crew as a gunner's mate in 1943. Of the repairs, he told the Baton Rouge Advocate in 2016. For about six months, we chipped paint. They gave us a respirator and a chipping gun, and we chipped paint. The County Star reports that by September of 1944, in a show of American industrial might and know-how, the West Virginia set out to join the Pacific Fleet at war. In October, West Virginia was part of the bombardment force used in the U.S. invasion of the Philippine island of Leyte. The Daily Herald reported, flying the same colors she had up on December 7, 1941, she led the column of battleships into Leyte Gulf and poured salvo after salvo into the Japanese forces before our troops went ashore. But the Japanese Navy would not let the invasion go unmolested, sending a massive fleet to the October 1944 Battle of Leyte Gulf. West Virginia was part of the bombardment group under the command of Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf, West Virginia was one of six battleships, along with four heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, 28 destroyers, and 39 motor torpedo boats sent to cut off the Japanese Southern Force in a night action to the Surigao Strait. It was a moment also of retribution. Five of the six battleships had been at Pearl Harbor. The Daily Herald writes, but with the Leyte beaches secured, an enemy threat was developing. Hoping to catch our forces off balance, a Japanese fleet was stalking the beachhead. Romano told the advocate, You hear about great battles, Midway, Coral Sea, Battle of the Bulge, D-Day, all were decisive battles, but you never hear about Surigao Strait. This was the last battleship battle in history. We had rumors that we were going to meet the Japanese fleet. We didn't know how true it was until the captain came on the PA system and informed us to get ready. 
that we were going to be involved in a night surface attack with the Japanese fleet. We had to get everything ready. We had to tie down all loose stuff aboard the ship. We didn't know how long we were going to be in general quarters. And sure enough, the fleet showed up. When we couldn't secure down on the ship, we threw overboard. The Daily Herald writes that again leading the battle line, the USS West Virginia waited until the night for the enemy fleet. At 0553, shortly after the commence fire order had been given, she let loose with mighty 16-inch salvos. Romano recalled, That just rocked the ship. It was in the 5-inch gun mount, and I didn't know if we were firing at them or if we were taking a hit. The concussion was so strong, with all eight guns going off, it would knock you up against the bulkhead. It actually pushes the ship sideways. It was just a tremendous experience. The concussion was so hard it busted a lot of the light bulbs. Our ship was sunk at Pearl Harbor and welded together, and even the bulkheads, some of them were split. The welding had come loose. That's how bad it was. Just like being hit, but it wasn't. We weren't being hit, but we had a lot of damage from our own guns. The Japanese fleet was vastly outnumbered, devastated by torpedo attacks, and at a tactical disadvantage as the American ships with superior radar had crossed their T, firing their salvos broadside while the Japanese were able to fire forward. The National World War II Museum writes, In what was to be the last engagement of battleships in history, West Virginia opened fire on an enemy ship, firing 16 salvos from her main battery. The captain's after-action report reads, At the time of the splash of our sixth salvo, when a distinct flare-up was seen, there were three officers and three enlisted men who saw the silhouette of a Japanese battleship by the characteristic construction of its foremast, but could not definitely determine her class. Due to the fact that she was heavily pounded with 16-inch projectiles and that she disappeared from all radar screens at 0412, it is certain she was sunk. The National World War II Museum writes, When the smoke cleared, the target was discovered to be the Japanese battleship Yamashiro, which sank in minutes. Though West Virginia's captain let the crew claim credit, the damage had been inflicted by five battleships, plus cruisers, throwing on the Japanese ship and making it a group effort, which sank her. We got even for Pearl Harbor, Romana said. We got even. And the ship nicknamed the Wee V continued. The National World War II Museum writes, After her triumphant engagement at Surigao, West Virginia continued her tear across the Pacific, supporting the landings at Mindoro, Luzon, Iwo Jima, and finally Okinawa. After spending years in dry docks and shipyards, West Virginia put in 223 days in battle, where she shot down eight would-be kamikazes and assisted with 12 others. Her number came up on April 1, 1945, when one successful Japanese pilot plowed his aircraft into Wee V, killing four sailors and wounding 23. But after Pearl, one enemy aircraft was akin to a mosquito bite, and she stayed in the action. On September 2, 1945, USS West Virginia was in Tokyo Harbor to witness the final surrender of the Japanese Empire. Five members of her band were sent to join the band of USS Missouri to play at the surrender ceremony. She was the only one of the Pearl Harbor battleships to be present that day. The ship that had been sunk on the first day of the war, seemingly damaged beyond repair, had somehow miraculously survived to witness the end of that war. The National World War II Museum writes, She sat silently, ghastly, in the distance, a triumphant reminder that Japan had gambled and lost. Initially placed in the reserve fleet on March 1, 1959, the five remaining battleships of the standard type were stricken from the rolls. West Virginia was the last to be broken up. She was sold for scrap on August 24, 1959. Remember, download World of Warships using the link in the description. Use the promo code WARSHIPS to get free to blues, credits, premium playtime, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.